So today we're going to be using what we've learned thus far to put numbers in order on the number line. And this is important because we want to gauge the relative aspect of each number in relation to another number. Um, in order to do that, we're going to look at a list of numbers, and first we're going to list them in order from least to greatest, which means we're going to go from our largest negative, negative 10, to our next largest negative, negative 4. Once we're out of the negative values, we go in order from smallest to largest in the positives. So 0, then 5, then 7. Okay? And on our number line, now your number line might be slightly different than mine, you want to have enough space between negative 10 and 7. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at negative 10, and I'm going to count if I did it by 1s, negative 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I wouldn't even make it to 0, let alone 5 or 7. If I went by 2s, let's see, that'd be 8, 6, 4, 2, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. I would make it. So I'm going to list my number line by 2s. And what you can do is you can make your number line whatever scale you want. Mine is by twos to fit all of your numbers. And then the only task that we have left is to list these numbers on the number line. I have a negative 10. I have a negative 4. I have a 0. And now, here's where we run into our first issue. I don't have a 5 on my number line. So again, relative quantities is what we're after here. 5 is going to be in between 4 and 6. So I'm going to put a point in between 4 and 6 and call it 5. Likewise, 7, albeit it isn't on my number line, I know relative is between 6 and 8. It is greater than 6. It is less than 8. So let's pop a number right there. Boom. And that's all we're doing. So today, if we were to graph whole numbers, we would graph that no problem. But that's not all we're after today. We're after simplifying certain fractions, which means I need to know what this fraction is. So I'm going to, have to do some work on the side and figure out what is 2 or what is 5 halves. The way I'm going to figure that out is I'm going to divide the denominator into the numerator, divide 2 into and I'm going to get, okay, this is going to fit in twice, one. I need an extra zero, so I'm going to put a decimal in my number, which is going to fit in five. Aha. So I know my numbers are actually zero, 2.5, negative four, two, and negative six. And this is how I'm going to look at them. I no longer need to worry about where the fraction is because I can see where it exists as a decimal. And again, I'm going to list them in order from least to greatest. Negative 6, negative 4, 0, 2, 2.5. And so my number line needs to encompass somewhere from negative 6 all the way through 2.5. I noticed that on my above number line, to get 2.5, counting by twos should be very easy. Let's see if I can count by ones. Negative 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So this works. I can do this by ones. So I label my number line as listed by ones. And now all I do is I go and list my points somewhere on this number line. And I list them above, so my point is on the line. This is not to say that we can put a point above the line or below the line. Each point must be on my number line. I cannot put a point up here. It has to be on the line, negative 4. And we'll learn much later what happens if I try and put a point up here, what that means. And that's actually going to be a lateral number. We don't want to deal with those just yet. So always know your points must exist on the number line we drew. You cannot put them above or below. And now the last one, 2.5 doesn't exist. But I know 2.5 is greater than 2 and less than 3. So I'm going to put a point between the two values. And I'm going to label it as its original form 
of five halves. And there we go. Let's do one more. So on this one, I have two fractions, which means I'm gonna have to do this simplifying that we did in this one twice. So I'm gonna take the bottom number, four, and divide it into the top number, five. Four goes into five once. Carry a zero, which creates a decimal. Twice, and five times exactly. Boom. So I have this fraction turned into a decimal. And I'm gonna do the same thing to my 19 fifths. I'm gonna take the bottom number, five, and divide it into the top number, 19. Five goes into 19 three times. I need to carry a decimal, or I need to carry a zero, which gives me a decimal, 3.8. So that gives me, my list of numbers is negative 1.25, 2, 8, and 3.8. Almost in the same order. The only thing that I have to change is these two. They're going to swap. So 3.8, 8. And there is my list of numbers. So we already run into a problem on this one because 1.25 isn't necessarily something we want to put in the number line. Let's list the next <clears throat> largest negative value beyond it, negative 2. And now let's see. To go from negative 2 to 8, that's going to be a span of about 10 numbers. Let's count these values, let's say, by 2. So 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. And so I'm listing my entire number line by 2s. And all I do now is I go ahead and I list each one of these on where it exists in the number line. Negative 1.25 is relative between these two. So I put it, but I don't list it as the decimal, I list it as its original fraction, negative 5 fourths. 2. And then I have another number almost at 4. It is between 2 and 4, but closer to 4 because it's almost. And 3.8 was my 19 fifths. The last number is 8. Boom. There we go. And so as we round this out with the last value, I have three fractions, which means I need to do this not once, not twice, but three times. I need to divide the denominator into the numerator. Already I noticed it doesn't work, so I need to drag down a zero, which means I need to create a decimal. It fits in seven times. Five. So I know my first number is going to be 0 0.75. And I get that. Next, again, I'm going to divide my denominator into my numerator. I'm going to see how many times 8 goes into 7. Already I know it doesn't fit in once, so I'm going to have to create a decimal. I know it fits in 8 times for 64. Drag another decimal down. 8 fits into 67 times for 56. Drag another 0 down. So I get 0 0.875. And the last one, I'm going to divide 16 into 5. Now I know already it doesn't fit, so I'm going to have to create a decimal. And therefore, it fits 3 times. 48. Carry it out at 2. I need another 0. It fits in once. 4. And we notice how this is continuing onward. Well, I don't actually need much more than 3.1, and then I can kind of fill in where they are relative to each other. So I'm going to pause right there, and I'm going to pop over to my number line and say, okay, I need to go from, it looks like from 0 to my biggest one isn't even at 1. So I'm going to start at 0 and go by tenths. Oh. And so I'm going by 0 0.1s. 
and then I just take my numbers and plot them on there. So in this case, my 0.75 is going to be my 3 fourths. My 0 0.875 is going to be my 7 eighths. my 0.31 something is going to be my 5 sixteenths. Now we notice this time we didn't even need to finish the list of 5 sixteenths, which is going to be 0 0.31. We could list them in order of 0 0.31, comma, 0 0.75, comma, 0 0.875, which would give us the list that we would need to graph. We don't need to in this case. And there we go. So today we're going to be ordering numbers on a number line. This is an extension of what we did yesterday because today we're going to be seeing things like radicals pop up in our number lines. We're also going to be seeing several different factors that are going to fall between two values of our range and how do we put numbers like that into place. So let's go ahead and get started. The idea of what we covered yesterday was we're going to take our list of numbers and we're going to list them in order from least to greatest. And we notice already we have something new in our list of numbers. We have this thing called pi. And for many of you, you might remember the fact that pi is equal to 3.14159265539, and it's a decimal that continues on forever. But most of us know it as 3.14, which lets us rearrange our list knowing that value into the following format. We list our biggest negative number first, which is a negative 15, then we have our negative 1, then we have our 3, and then before we put our 4, we know pi is in between the values of 3 and 4. So we go ahead and say pi and then 4. And this gives us the guideline of what order we should see these things pop up on our number line. So the way that we normally are going to be doing a number line is we're going to start off with our lowest number as our leftmost point, so negative 15. And I'm going to see what I need to count by in order to get to 4. Well, if I count by 1s, negative 14, negative 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, negative 6 is as high as I'll go. I won't actually be able to graph that number. So instead of counting by 1s, let's count by 2s. Negative 15, negative 13, 11, 9, 7, 5, 3, negative 1, positive 1, positive 3. I could almost get that in. So I bet you if I count by threes, so negative 12, negative 9, negative 6, negative 3, 0, 3, 6, 9, and 12. Yes, I in fact can span all of my numbers. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to put threes over here beside my number line. Not something we necessarily need to do right now, but it will come in handy once we start scaling a coordinate plane. So we're going to go ahead and start that practice early. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to list all numbers of which we see a point. I see a negative 15, and I see the number 3. So I'm going to put negative 15 and 3 on my number line. Now, I know between 15 and 3, I should see a negative 1. And I don't see a negative 1 on my number line, so it must be between two of these values. So we know that negative one is going to fall between these tick marks and I'm going to put a point right there and call it negative one. Now I've graphed that one. Now here's the thing. I know pi is 3.14. It's going to be between three and six, but so is the number four. So this is why the order is important beforehand. So I know that I'm going to put pi and then four between these two values. So I have pi and then four. Now, they're all squished right in there, but the idea is that we've graphed every number available. So let's move on to the next set. So here we're dealing with the square root of 10, which means that I'm gonna need to go back and I'm gonna need to remember what my squares are. One squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16, and what we'll notice is that the square root of 10 isn't in this list. I do know that 10 is greater than 9, and it's less than 16. So if I draw a line right here, 
If I know the square root of 10 is greater than 9 and less than 16, that must mean that whatever the square root is is going to be between 3 and 4. So I'm going to take a guess and say, let's say 3.1. And I'm going to make that the equivalent of my square root of 10. Now, I'm not going to actually evaluate to see is 3.1 the square root of 10. It's going to be a guess. And I'm going to take a look and say, do I see any other numbers that are between 3 and 4? Because if I do, I'm going to need to evaluate that a little further. But I don't right now. So I know the fact that I can just go ahead and list my list. 1, square root of 10, 4, and then 6. And there's my list of numbers. Square root of 10 being 3.1, so it's going to come after the number 1, but before the number 4. And so, again, I'm going to start my list off with the number 1. And I'm going to go up to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 10. This time I'm counting by 1s. All of them fit just by going with the regular old iterations. I'm going to list the numbers that I see. 1, I see the number 4 and I see the number 6. Now, the square root of 10, I don't see on here. I also don't see 3.1 on here, but I know 3.1 is going to be between the values of 3 and 4. So again, I'm going to put a point somewhere between these values, and I'm going to say, hey, here's my square root of 10. And there we go. Now, that was easy with 1, but what happens if I have two square roots? I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to count up my list of squares until I pass that number. Because I know that this 30 is bigger than 4, its root's going to be bigger than 2. So I'm going to go up to 3. It's still bigger than 9, which means its root's going to be bigger than 3. Bigger than 16, which means it's bigger than 4. Bigger than 25 but not bigger than 36, which means somewhere between here, between 25 and 36, is my 30, which means its root is somewhere between 5 and 6. Let's say 5.5, just to be even. So I know that this I'm going to estimate as 5.5. I also have the square root of 40. Now, that's not on my list yet because I haven't passed it up. And that's only when I square 7 to get 49. Do I see this is where my 40 is? It's between 36 and 49, which means between 6 and 7, let's say 6.5, is a good estimate of what my value of the square root of 40 is, 6.5. So let's go ahead and let's relist this list of numbers in order from least to greatest. So 5.5 is the lowest, so I'm going to list my square root of 30. And then 6, 6.5 is next, so square root of 40, and lastly is my 7. So I'm going to start my list with the lowest number, but my lowest number is a root and a decimal, so I'm going to start just below that, at 5. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And again, I'm counting this by 1s. So, I'm going to go ahead and list the numbers I see. I have a 6 and I have a 7. Now, in between 6 and 7, I have the square root of 40, which we said was in between 6 and 7. So on my graph, I'm going to put a point between 6 and 7 and call this the square root of 40. Likewise, before the number 6, so in between 5 and 6, I'm going to put another point, and I'm going to call this number the square root of 30. And now what I did, because these were really crushed right here, and I don't want to have the same problem that I did up here, is I just drew a little line going up for my point saying, hey, here's the label. And that should help us out. So let's do one more, and let's do a harder one. Now, a harder one might be where we have nothing but roots. We've already learned that that's not really a big deal. We list our squared tables, 3, 4, 
five, six, seven. We know them all the way up to seven right now. One, four, nine, 16, 25, 36, and 49. So that will hit 19 and 40, but 50 is still beyond that. So I'm gonna have to go and include an eight squared in there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scan my table for 19. Oh, I passed it, which means somewhere between these two is my 19. Do the same thing with 40. Oh, I passed it, which means somewhere between these two is gonna be my 40. And then my 50 is in between the next set. So that tells me that somewhere between these two values, between 16 and 25 is 19, which means somewhere between four and five, let's say 4.5 is a good estimate for 19. Between these two values, between these two squares, 36 and 49 exists 40. So I'm gonna say between six and seven, 6.5 exists my 40. And same thing between seven and eight, because 50 falls between these squared values, I'm gonna say 7.5. Now again, these aren't exact. This is actually gonna be closer to 7.1, but I know I gave three numbers that are between two values. So when I list them in order from least to greatest, I'm gonna say the square root of 19 comes first, because that's my lowest. Next, I have my square root of 40. And last, I have my square root of 50. So I'm gonna make my table, starting with just below this, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And I'm going by ones. And I'm gonna say, hey, Square root of 19 is in between four and five. So between four and five, I'm gonna say there's my square root of 19. 40 is between six and seven. So I put another point right there. And then 50 is between seven and eight. Boom, right there. So now I've listed each one of these on my number line and we're good. The next two questions are gonna deal with something a little different. We're gonna see both fractions and radicals in the same thing. And so first off, I need to evaluate this fraction. And I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna divide the bottom five into 14 to see where it's at. I'm just gonna do a little bit of long division to figure out where it goes. Let's see, five goes into 14 twice. Ooh. So now I need to add my zero, so I can pop that in there. So that adds a decimal to my answer, 2.8. So 2.8 is a good estimate for my 4.5. And I'm gonna do the same thing, three, four, one, four, nine, 16. I'm gonna make my squared tables until I run into 12, which I notice I do that between three squared and four squared, that's where 12 is. So I'm gonna make a good guess of like, let's say 3.5. That's a good estimate of the number square root of 12. And so these are already listed in order. So I'm not gonna to have too much to deal with. I have 14 fifths and the square root of 12. 14 fifths I know starts at two, so I'm gonna start just below that, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I'm going by ones. The last thing I do is I just plot my points. 2.8 is not on my list, but I know it's between two and three. So there's my 14 fifths. And then 12 is gonna be between three and four. Square root of 12. Boom, not bad. Lastly, we're gonna do the same thing down here, except for we're gonna to have to do it twice. So I'm gonna take five and divide it into six, and I'm gonna take seven and divide it into 11. And I'm gonna see what these two fractions are equivalent to. Five goes into six once. I need to bring down a zero, which means I add a decimal. 
So I drag a zero and I get 1.2 is equivalent to six fifths. When I do the second one, again, I get one, four, I drag down a zero, I get five, Ooh, I have to drag down another zero. So I'm just gonna stop right there. I could, I could keep going, but there's really no need to. I have 1.57, I have 1.2, I know they're separate numbers. So that really makes it a little more difficult when I'm trying to figure out what the square root of two is. Because I know it's way up high, one and four. So I know it's gonna be somewhere between the numbers one and two, and unfortunately, so are both my other numbers. Which means I'm gonna need to figure this out a little more exactly than I did before. So let's start out with one of these two numbers. Is it greater than or less than this number? Because that'll tell me, as of right now, I have two numbers in my list. I have six fifths and I have 11 sevenths. And I need to know whether or not my square root of two is gonna go between the two, if it's gonna go before the six fifths or after the 11 sevenths. So I'm gonna test out 1.2 squared and see if I get two. If it's not quite two, then I know that six fifths is gonna be smaller than my square root of two. So it's either gonna be in one of these two spots. And then I'll have to go test the other one. And then I'll do the same to this. If I test 1.57 and that's still not able to reach two, then I know my square root of two is over here. But let's go ahead and let's try out one of them. Let's try out 1.2 squared. So 1.2 times 1.2. We get four, two, hold my zero, two, one, four, four, one, two decimal places, 1.44. So 1.44 isn't quite two. So what I know is that the square root of two is not less than 1.2 because it would be greater than that. It's gonna be in one of these two spots. So now I need to see, is it greater than 11 sevenths? So I'm gonna try out 1.5. I say, okay, 1.5 times 1.5, 25, carry my two, seven, hold my zero, five, one, five, two, two. 2.2, okay, so now we've passed it up, which means that 11 sevenths is gonna be bigger than the square root of two, so I know it can't be over here. The only place left to put my number is between these two values. So albeit I still don't know exactly what the square root of two is, I know it's bigger than six fifths because it's more than 1.2 squared. I know it's not 11 sevenths because it's not 1.5 squared. And really what I should have done is squared 1.57, but 1.5 was still too high, so if I wanted any bigger, that'd be even higher. But regardless, we figured out the order that we're supposed to go in. So let's go ahead and let's list our numbers. So if I'm gonna start with a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and I'm going by ones, what I know is that all three numbers are gonna be between here. So what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to list three dots two, three, and I'm gonna say my first dot, I'm gonna draw my line, is six fifths. My middle dot is the square root of two, and my end dot is gonna be 11 sevenths. Boom, and there we go. So today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be starting the process of solving equations. Now, there are four steps to solve any equation. Cleaning them up, making sure the variables are in one spot, isolating the variable and isolating the coefficient. And we do that by asking these four questions and these are the steps that we do. Today we're focusing on the last one and that one alone. Does it have a coefficient? And the way we handle that is we isolate the variable through this m slash d means the inverse of multiplication and division. So the opposite of multiplication slash division. Whatever you see, do the opposite. And so let's start out with some warm-up problems. Now, for our warm-up problems, what we're gonna look at is the variable is already isolated. Everything, every one of these is good. So we're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna clean up the right side of the equation. And we say, okay, if x is 11 plus six, 
11 plus 6 must be 17. So therefore, my x is 17. And I box it up. Oh. That works the same if I have a slightly longer version on one side. If y is all of this, well, all I need to do is evaluate everything over here, and I'll know what y is. So let's follow them in order of operations. 13 plus 1 is going to be 14. So y equals 5 times 14. And then I multiply 5 times 14. I don't see an operation, so I know I'm going to assume that that's a multiplication. So y is, let's see, 14 times 5. 4 times 5 is 20, carrying my 2, 70. y is 70. Awesome. So we notice that if everything's all only on one side, we just follow order of our operations, and then we continue forward. But what if everything's not all on one side? So here I have a 2r. And I remember that does the r have a coefficient? Does it have a number attached to it via multiplication or division, which it does, that typically comes in front of the letter? Yes, yes, and yes. So how do we handle that? by isolating the variable through the inverse of multiplication and division. So the inverse means the opposite. So how is that 2 connected to the r? Well, through multiplication. And what is the opposite of multiplication? Division. So I am going to, let me do this in a different color, divide both sides by that 2. Because if I multiply by 2 and divide by 2, that cancels out. That's a 1. But if I divide on the left, I have to divide on the right as well. I always have to find that equal sign and make sure my equations are balanced. And so r times 2 divided by 2 is simply r. On the right side, 20 divided by 2 is 10. And let's see if that makes sense. If you have, let's say, r is rockets, two rockets, for $20. How much is each rocket? Well, if I have two rockets, I'm going to divide that in half, and I'm going to divide this in half to get one rocket is $10. And that's exactly what we'll do with the math. One rocket is $10. So let's try that with this one. Now, in this case, if we ignore the negative for a moment, if you have five tacos, for $55, how much does each taco cost? Well, I divide by 5. It's no different with the negative. If I would divide by that number out front, it, if it was positive, then I'm going to divide if it's negative. So I'm going to divide both sides by negative 5. And so I know negative 5 divided by negative 5, any number divided by itself is equal to 1. So I have a 1t. 55 divided by 5, let's see, bottom into top. That means that's going to work one time and one time. Yeah, okay, that fits exactly. So it's going to be an 11. But I have a positive divided by a negative, which we know every time we have two different signs and we multiply or divide, they're going to end up giving the difference. So here we have r, or in this case, t, is equal to negative 11. So, kind of see what's going on here. Anytime you see multiplication via, basically it's because there's no symbol between the variable we're trying to isolate for and the number, we undo it with division. Let's try something a little harder. This one's going to take a couple steps, but again, I just want to divide by 6. So before I do that, let's clean up this side of the equation. So here I have 6x is equal to 2, and if I follow order of operations, whatever is inside the parentheses, 5 plus 4 is 9. Then I multiply. So 6x is equal to 2 times 9 is 18. And here's where I have 6 Let's say X stands for, I don't know, playing card sets. I have six cards, 
and 18 friends. How much, how many people can play with each deck of cards? Well, if I have six decks and 18 people, I'm gonna see how many fit in each group and divide by six, which means the number of people that fit in this group are going to be three. So again, we notice that any time we have a number and a variable connected via multiplication, just undo it with division. 6 divided by 6 is 1. That disappears or cancels out. 18 divided by 6 is 3. And that works the same if it's two steps or if it's a bunch of steps. So here, remember, fractions have parentheses. Let's go ahead and simplify that. 8 plus 7 is 15. 15 plus 25 is going to be, let's see, that's 30. 40. 40 divided by 4, negative 5a is equal to 10. And the last step is how do I get rid of that negative 5? Well, it's as simple as if it's connected via multiplication, divide it out. So 10 divided by negative 5, any positive divided by negative is going to be a negative. 10 over 5 is 2. Awesome. And last but not least, I do the same thing down here. I have the variable only on one side, so I'm going to clean up everything I can on this right-hand side. So I'm going to follow the fraction and do what's in the top first. So 36 minus 20 is going to be 16. And then I do what's inside the parentheses. 16 divided by 2 is going to be 8. And then in this case, I have 8m is equal to 2 times 8, which is 16. The last step, because this is connected via multiplication, I undo it with division. So I'm going to divide the left and get m, because those cancel out. And then I say, how many times does 8 fit into 16? Exactly, 2. There we go.